in the chat, so I'm hoping someone else can do that for me. Um, I will. Okay, great. I'm sure, yeah, Andy, Nancy, Claire. Um, okay, so just to let you know, I'm going to um, start off sharing, I hope, my screen. And let's see, I can share all sorts of things. Look at that. Select one. Okay. Um, all right, so do you see the Themis website? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to just start off with uh, the data that um, folks are using, just so you can kind of see uh, some wiggles. <laughs> so this data can get, um, you can get to the data I'm going to show you. So this is kind of the, uh, the, the first E in the five E's, right, exploration. So I'm not telling you much. I'm just going to show you something and have you um, just wonder here for a minute. So if we go to education and outreach and educational programs, education programs and GEONS program, uh, many of you are part of the GEONS program, or some of you are, and some of you are part are the GEONS schools. So you can see where, where the GEONS schools are. So these are schools across the country that are part of the Themis project, and they have um, scientific instruments at their schools taking measurements every day that actually the researchers on Themis use on a regular basis. Um, and not only do the researchers use it, but the uh, students at the schools, at many of the schools, not all of them, but many use it as well. And in a little bit I'll have um, Vic, Laura, Wendy, and Jim type in here, but not quite yet. <laughs> Um, so here is the data coming from these schools, and data, yep. Okay, so if you go here, you can look at the data in three different ways. We're going to look at the XYZ plots for a moment. And when summer hits, usually a lot of these sites go down because they're at schools or near schools or at someone's house because it was the superintendent's house, and then he sold it to a citizen um, in Wisconsin, Wendy's neighbor, and now there's a woman <laughs> who's helping us all out and uh, has this magnetometer at her, or this instrument at her, at her house when she bought the house, and we had to have lots of conversations <laughs> about that. Um, so it's, and I'll tell you more about these instruments soon. So the, these are kind of the, the plots that, um, that the students can see and use. And these plots vary across the, uh, along the day. This is a 24-hour plot of X, Y, and Z. So you can see these are also different latitudes and longitudes. So there's, um, there's magnetometers in Alaska and Michigan. Uh, there's Laura Orr's magnetometer. Um, here's Peterburg. This is Vic Troutman's magnetometer. Uh, Carson City, Jim Beans, that's in Jim Beans' neighborhood. And Schwano, Wisconsin. This is the one that's in um, Wendy's neighborhood. So this is the one at the at the person woman's house who uh, bought it bought it with the house. <laughs> Uh, so you see these different plots. So, so what are these plots and what is the scientific instrument? Um, so we're going to talk uh, briefly about that and I'll talk a little bit about why it's important and then I'll have um, uh, Jim and Vic and Laura and Wendy, any of you who want to share something about your use of these, this data um, and you all can kind of pipe in and then we will um, Kind of open it up to some to some quite uh, some questions, and uh, of course you, you all have been doing great using chat for questions too. And if there's something that should be answered right away, just let me know. Okay, so um, wiggles, wiggles, wiggles. As we as Martha Waro yesterday talked about, uh, plots are very useful and important in science and in your classroom. I know you all, uh, a lot of you are you use graphing. Um, so, but before we can even talk about what these mean, I think it's important to understand the scientific instruments that, that are taking this data. So there's a question of what, how do scientists know what we know? 
And the working with this data really addresses that question. How do we know all these things we know about the universe? And a big way, a way that we know is by using these um, things called scientific instruments that measure the natural, measure natural phenomena, and then we uh, infer and make models of what that means. So I'll take you a little bit of, through that. So the, the scientific instrument that makes these plots, um, it, it's called a magnetometer. And so it's magno from magnetic, and meter is to measure. So it measures magnetic things. Um, so what is a common magnetometer that you all may know? Anyone know a common magnetometer that's in most, or maybe not most, but many households? Anyone? Are you chatting? No, I'm watching the chess. <laughs> compass is a magnetometer. Yes, go ahead. Yes, a compass. A compass is the magnetometer. So um, here I have a compass from my house. Or you might want to stop sharing your screen. We can't see you anymore. Oh, that's not good. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering. I was wondering about that. One or the other. Okay. Good to know. Because I'll go back and forth. Okay. So here's a compass from uh, my house. And this is measuring magnetic fields in this room that I'm sitting in. And what are some of the ma magnetic fields in this room that it might be measuring? Anyone? Oh, it, 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 I guess any moving electron. Any moving electron. That's right. So I've thought up. So for example, the lights up there. They're moving electrons in there that cause uh, electricity. So um, this compass is going to pick up some of the electricity from uh, the magnetism from that moving electrons. Um, it might pick it up from yeah any any any. That's exactly right. Um, if I were out in the woods with no um, obvious moving uh, or any obvious electric electrical currents, what might this be measuring? My little compass here. What do we take it what do we take compasses out in the woods for? The earth's uh, magnetic field so we know which way's home. Exactly. So we it measures the Earth's magnetic field so we know which way's home. So the the red um, will point north. And then it will always point north because it aligns itself with the magnetic field. And so then if we know which way is north and we've been keeping track of how we've been moving throughout the woods, then hopefully we can get back <laughs> the way we came. But it takes a little bit of uh, practice to use a compass um, well um, out in, in nature. Um, so... Basically, but what you can do when you're when you're out and about um, in the woods is you could take you could take this. Let me see if this will work. Can you see? I can't now see what you see because my screen's kind of funky. But can you see it, kind of? Yeah. Okay. So um, you can you can notice. Let's say I'm standing here. You can notice which way the magnetic field is pointing. And then as you're moving, let's say I move this direction, so I move east. Let's see, I have to align my compass up so that the, see that they make this compass very nice, so the red is with the red. Okay, so you align the north with the north, and then if I move in this direction, I'm moving east. And if I'm moving in this direction, I'm moving west. And if I move in this direction, I'm moving south and north. So what I can do is basically ma um, align this with the magnetic field. So what that tells me is that Earth's magnetic field basically, mo for the most part, points north. And so if I were to kind of map out the magnetic field and draw lines as I was moving along, it the lines would always just point um, north-south. 
for the most part. Um, unless I happen to be around a lot of volcanic um, type of rock or rock with a lot of iron in it. And then my compass might get, uh, might actually move um, because there's a lot of iron in, uh, or there's a lot of um, uh, iron. Basically, the, the iron will, will modify the field of earth. And so my compass will no longer point north. It might point towards a mountain <laughs> full of iron. So um, I see Nancy's. Um, Oh, she's just posting a sort of a, a a useful tip on how to see everybody else's videos so you wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah, no, that's good. The only question that you might want to answer is there's been two questions that came in. First of all, Jim wants to know if you can show student work. So I figured maybe after you're done with your intro. Yeah. Um, also, Maggie asked, uh, are there any magnetometers in Hawaii? We have all these telescopes. I would think they are here somehow. The closer the readings are it, to Hawaii, the more my rascals will get into it. <laughs> right, and we'll talk about that. Um, there probably are, um, but in terms of the ones that are part of this project, um, there are not. So, but there, there may be a way, and, and later on, if you're interested in having this conversation, maybe in the breakout, um, I would love to, to brainstorm how to write a proposal to get a magnetometer in your area. Uh, the UCLA folks, the University of California, Los Angeles folks are the ones who build these magnetometers, the, the research grade ones, and they're always looking to put new ones in new places. So, um, if, we might be able to write some proposals to get some of these magnetometers in your school. So you can keep that in, in the back of your mind. So, so compasses, so these compasses basically, so here's a, a little compass that we use with school um, when we're teaching uh, about magnetism in the classroom because you can put it on an overhead projector and project the light through here so that as you're working with it, um, the students can see uh, where the where the arrow is pointing, and there are a whole bunch of magnetism activities uh, in NASA wavelengths. So all the Themis magnetometer activities uh, that went through wavelength uh, went through product review, and that um, Laura and Jim and uh, Vic and uh, Wendy all helped um, design and write can be found in that NASA wavelength site that Andy was showing you earlier. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the magnetometer. So, so magnetometers, so I'm going to move from compasses to magnetometers. So um, the simplest magnetometer, and I don't have one here, but so this is a two-dimensional magnetometer. It just me measures the magnetic field parallel to Earth. Um, so it's weighted in a way to just look at the north-south as it's flat on Earth. So just as, as I was showing you. However, um, there are magnetometers that also can point up and down. And what you'll, with those kind of magnetometers, you, what you'll see is that the compass, and this is actually, this is weighted a little bit, but um, it's still pointing pretty much in the right direction. If you go up, and, if you use your compass, um, if you use a three-dimensional compass, it also will show you that the, magnet, the magnetic field is not only pointing north, but it also points into the Earth in the northern hemisphere. Um, or in the southern hemisphere, this, this whole arrow would be pointing the opposite direction. So if I went to Australia, the, the white, the south part, um, maybe I can also... So, and now the south part would be pointing down, actually. So there, there's, there's a magnetic field in this room that's invisible, and we use a compass to make it visible. And so we learned two things from using the compass, or if we had a three-dimensional compass, then we would see that the magnetic field's pointing down and it's pointing north. So it has this, it's a vector, it's a three-dimensional vector, down and north. And if we went all around Earth, what we would find is, so now I have my Earth. So we were just talking about how um, on Earth, if, we, if I'm sitting, you know, here's, where's my North America? Here's North America. 
Okay, so if I'm sitting on North America and I have my compass, it points north. Okay, so if we now moved and we went south, okay, what's going on with my compass? Um, hold on one sec. Do, 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 do. Okay, let's, let's see. Okay. So, um, and then I said if you pull, if you pull the, if, if we have the magnet um, up and down, that it will point towards Earth um, in the northern hemisphere. But if you go to the southern hemisphere, it would point away from Earth. So here we can start to see what does the magnetic field look like out in space. And what's really interesting is that you can what we've actually done at nasa is to put these kind of compasses but a three-dimensional compass on a satellite now we're calling this a magnetometer because it's measuring magnetic fields and we can actually see that indeed as you go out around earth that the magnetic field points up around the equator and then you go towards the north pole and it points in towards the north pole and then um, out, it comes out of the south, southern pole. And the satellites that are orbiting Earth, like um, Van Allen Probe and like um, S, um, Iris, well, I'm not sure where Iris is going to go, but like Van Allen Probes and Themis, so they're orbiting Earth like this. And they have these little compasses, these magnetometers on board, and they're measuring what is the magnetic field out in space. And so as they move, their compass moves, and, it get, and then the, that information gets sent back to Earth, and we learn about the magnetic environment of Earth using these magnetometers. Laura, can I interrupt you for one second? So um, reading through the chat window, there's, there's some confusion about the... Uh, which part is attracted or pointing towards the Earth versus out in space and in the Northern Hemisphere versus the Southern Hemisphere. So I wonder if you could just go back over that little bit again and just maybe clarify it for some, some people. Sure. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another way to do it so that, that you, you have a couple different ways. Um, but I think that or maybe people could ask more specifically the question. Just Laura, so I, yeah. You, what's that thing that, is it a magna probe? Do you remember yeah. the thing? It, do you have one of those? That you, you know control? what? I, it, it's missing. Oh. <laughs> it's missing. I know I need a magna probe. I, I have, yeah, there it is. That's it. I have one. not in here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but do you have one there? No, oh, I I'm at home. It's at school. Bummer. I know. I'm so bummed. Ours is missing. I put out an email to everybody, and nobody can find it. We've even called people. Um, because I know it's really. Anyway, this is this is what you should take note of the Magna probe. <laughs> If you're interested in this kind of stuff, because it's really, really, really useful. Um, so we'll put that information on how to get those. So um, I think, Maggie, I think it would be really helpful at this point if you if you just ask Lori your question directly, which might help uh, with the understanding for everybody else, because I, I think the, the Geons teachers are probably more than familiar with this, but everybody else in the group is going to be lost at this point. So I think your question will be valuable to many people. Okay. So my question is, I was following what you were doing, Laura, up until, and so you showed us a compass. And in that compass, you said, okay, the red points north, and it also points down because the earth is magnetic? Yes. Okay, so, yes, I understand. But if I were in Australia or Chile, and I were to use that same compass, it wouldn't point down? The red wouldn't point down because I'm in the southern hemisphere? 
It would point up. But it would still ah! point, But it would still point north. It will always point north. So if I have it flat like this. So now I have it flat with my table, right? So it will always point north, no matter where you are. Even in the southern hemisphere, it will point north. Yes, and I understand it'll point north, but the fact the Earth is magnetic. So why doesn't the red part go down? If it's going down in the northern hemisphere because the Earth is magnetic, isn't the Earth equally magnetic all around? Uh, the answer to the, the bo they're, both answers are no. <laughs> ah! But um, <laughs> we were just talking about that. I don't know if you saw those AT and T commercials with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so so let's now look at a bar magnet for a minute. Can we do that? Okay, so if we use a bar magnet. And, okay, do you see how the red is pointing um, to the red? Yes. Okay, uh, we won't talk about that. But, um, so the arrow, ignore <laughs> the colors for a minute. But, um, now let's say this is the, the, the um, northern hemisphere for right now, okay? And so it's pointing into the northern hemisphere. And now if we go to Australia, that would be down here in the blue. And do you see how um, now it's pointing away from that? Yes, I do see, but maybe this will help me. Okay. So like in inside the earth then, so we have this metallic core going around. Right. Um, so inside the earth, in the southern hemisphere, the energy, I mean the, um, the charged particles point in, are of the opposite charge? No, um, well then they are, they, it's like this. So inside of here is essentially a coil. So see my coil here? Is that an electromagnet? Yes. Okay. Okay, so inside is an electromagnet. So let me let me show you my little electromagnet set up here. See if I can Okay, so here I have my electromagnet. So basically Okay, <laughs> Ooh, I have a little pack. Like <laughs> nom, 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 nom. <laughs> okay, so our electromagnet, so here's our electromagnet, and inside Earth is an electromagnet, right? So I'm going to, can we, I'm going to take Earth off for just a sec, so pretend Earth's still on there, mm -hmm. and I'm going to turn on my electricity to really make it, uh, Okay, I'm going to turn on my electricity to make it an electromagnet. Okay, so let's see what our compass does. Um, okay, so our compass... So you can kind of see how... Do you see how the compass moves around, how it moves? around this coil. It's, I really need a magna probe, like Wendy was saying. Um, uh, I don't have the tools I need. <laughs> this is frustrating. <laughs> well, I, I'm taking way too much time on this. I'm probably the only boof in the whole crowd. So like, forget about me and go on. No, 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 I think, um, it's I don't know okay. if, um, so, so basically the magnetism is pretty, fairly equal, but, okay, I guess this is, okay, do you see, I don't know, can you see okay here now? Um, so I see the at, arrow up. Right, now so I the arrow is pointing up, right, so it's now pointing towards the North Pole, 
and it's pointing away from the South Pole, right? Yeah. So the only place, so do you remember how Earth was, um, was over this whole thing? Uh-huh. So as we go to the North Pole, do you see how the arrow starts pointing in towards Earth or towards yep. the coil? Yeah. But down here, it points away from the coil or away from Earth? Uh-huh. So it's the same thing. So now if you're in the southern, so if you're under the coils or you're in Australia, it's going to point away from Earth but still north, and then you go up to America, and it's pointing towards down into America, but also still in the, towards the north. So it's really, it's really, a, it, it kind of, um, it's just the shape of the magnetic field. So Laura, I've just shared a, a cartoon graphic of um, the, the basically the, what happens when you do the mapping magnetic field activity to show the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. So looking at those arrows, Maggie, might help you reconcile why the compass points towards the Earth at one pole and away from the Earth at another pole. So Laura, I don't know if that's appropriate, but um, it might help with concept, conceptualizing this a little. Yeah, no, that's great. So here it is. It's actually upside down. I don't know why it's upside down. I didn't realize that. Um, I think we did an activity like this when we were in Chicago with um, with magnets, and we put it we put them on the Earth. Yeah. Do you remember, Laura? I yeah. think you were there. Yeah. So, like, okay, I'm just going to accept it all and go. It's okay. <laughs> you go. Okay. So, so you can figure it out. You can explore it a little more. Yes. I think, I think just, and I think that what, you're definitely not a booth. What's happening is that um, I, I'm trying to, to merge what it's like to sit, to be standing on Earth with a compass versus what it's like when you're out in space looking at what what a compass does so i think those two things like to to kind of get both of those in our minds at the same time is not a trivial task because it requires two different perspectives one standing on the earth and one out in space so yeah keep thinking about it and um i think it'll it'll come You'll have one of those aha moments in the shower, probably. <laughs> well, and Laura, I was, it just occurred to me that if there's enough interest with this group that perhaps at a future time we can have a Zoom session where we send the materials out, the magnet probes out to, to the teachers and the magnets and the compasses, and then we can all be doing it together. Yeah. That would be good. Okay, so, and this is, you know, electricity magnetism is not a trivial thing, and that's why I definitely want to make sure there's enough time um, for Jim and, and Vic and uh, Laura and Wendy to kind of talk about how they, how they, how they engage their students with this topic and, and really dig into it. So um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, finish up with a couple more things here. Um, so like we said, Themis has magnetometers. They're located way, do, way out on these booms out in space. Um, here's another picture of the booms. Because you have to get, the, the satellite also has magnetic fields associated with it. So you have to get the, ma the compasses, these magnetometers, far enough away from the satellite so they can actually measure the magnetic fields out in space. Um, and so you'll see on a lot of the helio missions, here's stereo, um, these, these kind of booms. Um, and then also magnetic on board satellites, um, even internally, so here's IBEX, internally to the satellite, they're often uh, magnetometers inside so that the satellite knows how to orient itself. Um, so, and it's called attitude, so it's, it's, it, it's got the right, <laughs> so, so you want your satellite to have the right attitude 
So it has a magnetic personality to keep it with the right attitude. <laughs> There's my little <laughs> silliness for the day. Okay, so it, so 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 we magnetism is really important to satellites, um, and also understanding space. Um, and, and space science. And then it's also important on the ground. So mag magnetometers are not only used to, um, to figure out how to get around, but uh, on Earth, but it also can tell us what's uh, embedded within the Earth. So a lot of the companies that find oil and coal and all these minerals that we use in our energy production are using magnetometers to determine what's underneath the Earth. Um, but you can also embed a magnetometer in the ground. So what um, the Geons teachers, G Jim and Laura and Vic and Wendy have at their school. So I brought a little bit of my backyard here today <laughs> to kind of show you um, what this was like. So um, we went out to the schools or some folks from UCLA. And, and I went out to Carson City, which was our first one. Um, and we went to a place kind of far away from anything with a flying electrons, with electrical current around. Um, and then we dug a hole <laughs> because we wanted the magnetometer. So this is my shovel. You see? Yeah, so we have a shovel. <laughs> I'm trying to give you a real life uh, experience here with these magnetometers. And some of the high school students were, were involved in this. Um, and so you have to dig, dig a hole and then you bury the magnetic field sensor, which really looked, looks like this. It's, the sensor is made up of iron and a coil. So it kind of inside the sensor, it looks like this. And the coil is picking up any changing magnetic fields, and the iron is turning those, the, the magnetic field into a, um, into a number. So, so between the changing magnetic fields and the static electric, the magnetic fields, um, with this kind of magnetometer, you can actually measure what the magnetic field strength is, as well as which direction it's pointing. So as the magnetic field in their backyards change, you can measure that. So they buried this sensor into the ground, and I like this. So here's our little magnetic field sensor. And then we tried to make sure that no, people would know where it was, so we put rocks around it. <sighs> Maybe special rocks that aren't found in the area, and hopefully not rocks that are magnetic. And then we attached that magnetometer to a big, see magnetism is so abstract and invisible, I wanted to give some concreteness to this. So, um, the, so here the magnetometer was in the ground and then there was a big basically electrical um, cord that came out of the magnetometer to go into the school and that cord had to be covered with a garden hose. So this is my garden hose from home. Um, and the garden hose basically is there so that uh, critters won't chew through the cable because little critters like squirrels and mice and I don't know other things like to for some reason they like to chew on wires. I don't know if you all knew that but so the garden hose keeps the magnetometer um, wire safe from the critters outside and then we buried this in the ground and then it went through a hole in the uh in the school and then the actual electronics box that then took all the signals from that sensor looks something like this it's just a black box and inside are a lot of different electronics that then take the signal from the sensor and turn it into something that um, then can be plotted onto the screen. So then that, th th those signals then get, get outputted into the computer and then we, I'm going to share my, I'm going to go back to sharing my, my magnetometer screen. And then the data from that sensor 
and that magnetometer then shows up in these three different axes. So if I click on um, this one, can you see this? I'm not sure if a pop-up box is sharing. Are you able to see the kind of the zoom in on this? Yeah, we yeah. Yet. Okay, great. So now what you're seeing here is um, the x-axis and the y-axis are the ones parallel to the Earth's surface. So those are the two that make up the compass needle that is flat to Earth. So if we just have this flat to my table, that's the x. Oh, you guys can't see that. <laughs> Forget. So, so my x and y-axis, this tells you how north it is pointing. And so what we tried to do is make the Y, which is the second plot, as close to zero as possible. Um, but a, as time goes on, that, the calibration shifts and change and that, that um, it goes away from zero. But if this was so that it was pointing directly, X would be exactly magnetic north. So you'd have zero in Y and you'd have the X axis be that, um, that strength. Um, what this tells you is that the uh, magnetic field uh, is a little bit off from the x-axis direction, and it's more at an angle. And then you see here at the bottom, this is the, the bottom plot number, the z-plot tells you how much the magnetic field is pointing in towards Earth. So this number is positive because we're in the northern hemisphere and the magnetic field points towards Earth. And it points towards Earth pretty strongly in Kiana because this is up in Alaska where it's almost pointing up and down. So you can see these numbers are much, much higher. This is magnetic field strength in nano Tesla. Um, these numbers are much bigger than the X axis, which if you think about vectors, that means that the vector in the pointing down is much longer than the vector pointing towards North because you're so close to North. Now you're really pointing down. So I know you, you don't have to understand all that, <laughs> um, but for those of you who did, that's great. Um, and for those of you who didn't, that's okay too. This is, um, there's so much to all of this. And, uh, and so what you can see is at all these wiggles, now these wiggles change according to what the, what's happening on the sun and how what's happening on the sun influences Earth. So when yesterday we were hearing about um, we were hearing about the um, the coronal mass ejections coming off of the sun that that both the uh, SDO is measuring, and sometimes those coronal mass ejections come all the way off, or these solar flares, or all sorts of things from the sun. Sometimes they come and interact with Earth. And when they do that, they change Earth's magnetic field just a little bit. But these magnetometers are incredibly sensitive. So just that little bit turns into uh, wiggles that we can see. And then up in Alaska, where you get the aurora borealis, um, there are electrical currents in that aurora borealis. And as Jim Bean at the very beginning said, when you have electrical currents, you have magnetic fields. And so those magnetic fields um, can also get picked up by these magnetometers buried in the backyard of the school or our very kind citizens of Wisconsin. So um, at, at this point, I think uh, I would like to have, um, I know Jim, you wanted to show some of the student work. Oh, I, um, I can wait till Vic, Wendy, or Laura want to go first. Okay, who, who would like to, to kind of talk a little bit about how this is used in your school? And while, while I'm waiting for you all to unmute, I see Wendy's unmuting. <laughs> um, I just, let me just show them, um, there is on here, I think, the schoolwork, Gian's schoolwork. So you can also see some of it here. So go ahead, Wendy, do you wanna? <clears throat> go first, I guess. Um, let's see. Okay. 
And if you guys, Laura and, and Vic and you guys, Jim, you want to help me out here. What we did is I was having them calculate magnetic field strengths every day, just mathematically. And then we would plot it on Excel. And then they would calculate the KP index. And that's something I think that would be valuable for Maggie that I think her students could handle doing that, using the X value of the to calculate KP. And then um, I had a student, and Jim, you were showing me this when we were in Alaska. He wrote a computer program to take that ASCII data and calculate the, um, the strength and then the KP from that. Uh, yes. Now, since Claire is here, I want to be very accurate, <laughs> okay, uh, because <laughs> I was corrected by Mark uh, when we were in Colorado. We were Mark from UCLA. He actually modified it for me and stuff. Okay. But, but you're right. But yeah, you, you definitely can do that. Absolutely. Well, I, I won't, I, 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 you don't have to worry about me. This stuff is all new to me as well. This is out of my, uh, out of my comfort zone for sure. Laura, on the other hand. Uh, no, 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 Claire, I, I say that with sincere respect. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here to make sure we're accurate and stuff. And, yeah. So he, one of my seniors last year did that, wrote that program. So uh, I'll be using that from now on. But I think it's valuable in having them learn how to calculate KP and then um, using a formula to calculate magnetic field strength. And then, Wendy, can I interrupt you real quick one sec? Can you explain to people what KP is and why it's important? KP, and now you guys help me out here. KP is the, uh, the strength or the how messed up the magnetic field of the Earth is. And I know that in order to get Aurora in Wisconsin, we have to have a KP of about six. So we would. At when we were on um, Solar Men trying to, you know, get some activity so the kids could actually see some, the possibility of having Aurora. But then, you know, as we approached Solar Max this last year, we had some pretty high KPs. And, and it seems like every time we could have gotten Aurora, it was cloudy in Wisconsin. Welcome to my world. Yeah. <laughs> So then what we did instead of, and I was talking to Vic in the small group and Maggie with this, instead of actually seeing the aurora, what I would do is go on space weather and, and I'd get pictures of places in Wisconsin that did have the aurora. And then we went back to the magnetometer data and we actually could see when that event hit the magnetic field. So we had a record of it. So we had the pictures and then we had the the magnetometer signature of it, where they could go back and calculate the KP. So I don't know. It was in, we do it. We did it like that more often than actually trying to predict it, because it was always cloudy. That's just some of the things that we did. Plus, I do the space science sequence stuff. Um, a lot of that, the uh, mystery. Um, I can't remember the name of that whole thing. But anyways, that's what we did. What uh, I would do, I, I have a very large range of students. I teach uh, astronomy to the seventh grade exploratory. And then also I try to incorporate the magnetometer data in both my physical science and my physics classes. But uh, when you look at the magnetometer data and you do get a event, and you see all of those big squiggly lines so that you know that, ooh, something is causing the Earth's magnetic field to move. Kids can handle that real easy because it's, it's quite uh, obvious that that line is jumping all over the place. And so you can then lead them, and for, at least for our students, auroras are, are always interested. They're always uh, they all want to see auroras. We do have clouds here about 300 days out of the year. So when we get a clear night with an aurora, it's a special event. Well, when the kids start looking at the data and they'll start seeing that, that those lines, wiggly lines, really starting to wiggle, they'll get excited because it means they can stay up late that night and watch to see if there's auroras. To go from there, we can go larger into the idea of predicting whether there should be
ARRs or not. At with some really, really basic, basic math, you can predict your index or your, your area, your K. And then finally, I took a use of the magnetometer as a piece of equipment. I worked through some lab activities that uh, we could, and of course, you got to tell Laura, say, hey, I'm going to be messing with your magnetometer a little bit. But in physics, we uh, designed a lab to find out whether distance and a magnetic field is an inverse square proportion or an inverse cube. Uh, we also tried to develop a lab with a, a frequency of a magnet going over the magnetometer, see if you could pick up the frequency changes, and at the rate at which the magnet was swinging over the magnetometer, which had some limited success. And then uh, we do uh, many of the, in the freshman level, many of the, the magnetic mapping, so they get an idea of what a magnetic field looks like. Once you get a picture of a magnetic field in your head, the Earth, then it begins to make sense what the magnetometer is measuring. But that's kind of what I use it for. And my own interest, I, I check it every day. All right, I can jump in next. I do a lot of the same things Vic does because I have a huge range of people Um, one of the other things that I do with my kids, because we are more south than Vic and I can't see the aurora very often, and I need a huge KP before I see anything cool, we still look at those lovely wiggles, but I've got my kids to where they look daily at the events on the sun, and they record those that happen, and then they track via some of the data on spaceweather.com and the NOAA space weather prediction site to kind of follow a KP, or not a KP, a CME event or a flare event from the sun to the earth. And they get to where they follow the magnetic field line changes, the proton flux changes. And even if they don't completely understand what's happening, they really get a tie between what the sun did how long it takes to get there for different types of energies and particles, what the Earth's reaction is going to be. That's where we can see Vic's KP calculation and his magnetometer data, Wisconsin, mine, and then down to Nevada. And we can see that difference, relate that to the KP number. And then the kids get to understand where, when we look at our wiggles on our line, what kinds of wiggles. It's it's pretty cool. Um, I did play with it in physics class too. I let them know that we're going to go mess with the magnetometer. We use it. In Somebody mute their their mic so we can we can't hear anymore. <laughs> That's Sally, and she's away from her computer. Here she's walking. Yep, and I'm back. Okay. But mostly um, astronomy, earth science, my middle school kids have tracked the KP numbers and the, um, I had them for six months or so calculate a KP every day and keep track of it just so that we can practice some longer term data tracking and analysis through Excel. And what they did with that is compared our uh, magnetic field strength number to some of the others across the United States and we even found a couple in Europe and compared that to the accepted global value of the strength of the magnetic field and how that changed and we tried to find out if we could match or see that magnetic field strength decline number or amount that people talk about. We didn't get a long enough survey but there's all kinds of things you can do with the data if you just get creative.
and to emphasize what Laura is talking about is to get results is to me not as important that you actually have students working with real time current data that is science quality that there are some professional scientists looking at it and using it and they have access to that and they get a chance to try to interpret what's going on that in itself is a pretty big hook huge even that little thing of having to no, we're going to play magnets or electricity around the magnetometer proves to the kids that this is real, important, usable, and you have to get permission from UCLA to do it. And that gains their interest in, um, they buy into what we're doing next a whole lot more than if I gave them a cool probe out of a box of stuff I have in the lab. Same activity, but this one is NASA based or UCLA based or Berkeley based, and they're they buy, they buy, they like it. And the process is far more important to them than coming up with actual factual, like amazing results. They tend to be okay with it ending less amazingly or concrete. They're okay with the process. And they do track it. I still have a kid from six years ago that calls me every time he sees our wiggle move because he's far south now. He wants to know if we can see anything yet. They buy into it and they stick with it. So what equipment are you using to get your data? We have a magnetometer on site from the Themis project, but I get my data from the website. That's where I pull out my archive data for the weekend days and for our daily uh, magnetometer readings. And it's easy to get, and I use everybody else's as well. Can yeah, to, to can include that, that? To, to emphasize that, our magnetometer that we have here is actually in the elementary school because we had to get it isolated away from the cars and the traffic and all the other magnetic interference so I don't even have it in my school building we go directly to the web page and use that data so we don't even our students don't even see the real computer data we get it filtered through the web page because of location that's what I do too because that magnetometer is in the back of that person's backyard from my Superintendent's old house. Can you show us that? The website? Yeah. Yeah, and how you, where you get your data and how you get it? Yeah. So um, that was actually, that's one of the options for the breakout session today is uh, because although, although we, we can't, I mean, we can't provide you with magnetometers um, unless we write proposals for it. Um, but for right now, anyway, uh, to have a magnetometer at your location is a, is a fairly expensive and involved process. But you and your students can access the data online just the same, exact same way that Vic and Laura and Jim and Wendy do. Um, and so Laura Patakolas is going to be available uh, later today to talk about how to do that as, as one of the options for the breakout. Nancy, how much time do we have left? I'm wondering if do we have time for Jim to show, because I think Jim, some of what you were going to show kind of also gets at that question a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, I, I can uh, do, do about five minutes. Is that cool? That's about what we have left is five minutes. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to share screen. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to go to uh, share screen here, and um, let's double check here. Okay, let's go to, let's see. Okay, so here's uh, share screen. Now, uh, to answer, I think it was, uh, hold on, let me uh, go to here. Uh, all you have to do is go up here and just type in uh, uh, Gion's Themis. Just type in Gion's Themis. And uh, when you do that, you get to this page right here, Artemis Themis EPO. Uh, just click on that. And uh, 
you can go to Gion's data, which is right here. And uh, what I like, to get, now Vic uses the squiggly lines, which, which is kind of cool, but uh, I like using the spectrographs. And because color, this displays a lot of data and it's easy for people to look at. Uh, you get uh, Kiana, McGrath, and, and uh, I'll, I'll have a student explain all this for you because it, it's uh, better if it comes from a student. And, but this is where you would get the data, is from right here. And uh, also, you can go up here to, uh, uh, was it, uh, schoolwork here, and it shows all the various students, like from Vic and various other teachers and stuff. But this is a student I had last year, uh, Will Struble. Uh, he's actually a, uh, a geophysics major now he, uh, at University of Nevada. Uh, he was our valedict valedictorian last year. Uh, so, it, you know, um, but anyways, we'll go ahead and download this video, and he uh, explains uh, how to use the data and, and how to uh, present it. And uh, uh, a couple more seconds here to download. All right. And uh, okay. And let's see here, let's open it up here. Okay, let me go ahead and make it. Okay, so basically when um, any sort of bonuses, this is more solar flares um, come up and send the sun across the earth, they affect the earth's magnetic field in a certain way. So, like, for example, in Kiana, Alaska, um, which you can put this data here, different amounts of solar flares are promised to affect the amount of activity in the Um, so, for example, the solar flare which occurred on April 16, just a few days ago, um, activity from it can be seen here in Kiana. Basically, the brighter the colors, the more intense the activity is in the magnetic field. And the activity we're seeing here was probably just enough to see um, some sort of aura, so yeah, the aura of light. Um, the farther south you go, so, for example, Wisconsin, Oregon, since the magnetic fields aren't um, coming together at the closer to the North Pole, there is less activity. So even though there was quite a bit of activity in Alaska, it's fairly calm that day in Wisconsin and Oregon. Um, over here, you can see what can happen when we have artificial interference, which appears as a red line, which the kind of hunger thing is basically hot, really high activity. But in reality, it could be something that will simply change like the key next to the network. Okay, uh, on that, uh, just one small correction should have been CME, uh, not not so much the solar flare, because that's I think that's X rays, which are electromagnetic radiation. But uh, he should have said that the CME, uh, coronal mass ejection, which are particles, protons, electrons, when they hit the Earth's magnetic field, then you get these disturbances or these these uh, 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 red lines here, or the red, uh, the more red, uh, the more geomagnetic solar activity you get. Now, if you get a perfect rectangle-shaped um, uh, object, here, let me go back to Wigio here. I think I put some on here way back here. Uh, let's double check here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, more posts. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to try the time here. More posts. Boy, yeah. Okay, now, okay, see uh, here, uh, the, these, this would be kind of calm. Uh, these here, here, here are like normal readings or within normal parameters. We start getting some red like this is indicative, uh, indi indicating some sort of maybe uh, solar-related geomagnetic activity. Now, when you get a false reading, uh, let's go down here. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Okay, here's, uh, yeah, here's a, I think this is when we had severe solar activity in the past couple of weeks here. Uh, this was uh, some definite geomagnetic activities here. But if you get a perfect rectangle shape here, uh, that's more in indicative of a man-made phenomenon or non-solar related. Like uh, I can go to our magnetic field, our magnetometer in Carson City, I can rattle my keys next to a the fence, which is right next to it, and I can produce uh, uh, a lot of activity just from that. Uh, moving car, uh, any kind of metal moving around, or uh, any type of other activities can cause a false readings to occur.
Uh, but uh, yeah, so here are some activities here. Uh, and and, a, and another thing we have is uh, uh, something more interesting is, uh, let's see, let me go to solar. Okay, this was some students put this together, and this is a pretty good one here. It kind of, uh, okay, turn the volume down here. Uh, this was presented in 2009, and it kind of goes through the whole thing here where, uh, we have the wavelength here and, you know, UV. And also I break down the UV as UVA, UVB, and UVC, especially for kids who want to, especially kids who sunburn. You tell them UVA is the aging one, UVB is the, what causes sunburns. And these two, you have to make sure your suntan lotion is UVA, UVB protection. And I tell them right here is the ozone layer, O3, which blocks out or absorbs the UVC, because UVC is what's going to kill you, or excuse me, kills bacteria, destroys DNA, and very bad. So if we didn't have an ozone layer, UVC would definitely come to the surface of the earth, and, and life as we know it may not exist. Uh, but anyways, if we go through here, and these, again, some students put this together. Uh, uh, this is a uh, this is from yesterday. This is a using a filter. This is a picture of the sun. Looks kind of white, and you can see some prominences here. Uh, but anyways, we go through here, uh, and uh, showing this is a the sun, a quiet, low activity. Uh, here's uh, high solar activity. And, and here's the important thing is uh, about every 11 years you get the solar cycle, uh, solar maximum, and I think ours was just, just this past May here with solar max, you get more of these sunspots that occur, and more sunspots possibly indicate more possibility of solar activity occurring, CMEs and solar flares. Uh, so we go through this here. Um, okay, so here's... Uh, uh, yeah, solar flare. Okay, here's a solar flare eruption right there. That was a solar flare which travels at the speed of light or near the speed of light. And then what follows is a CME, which comes next. Uh, this is a coronal mass ejection or plasma coming from the sun. Uh, protons, and uh, they, they travel less than the speed of light. It take, you know, and then they hit the uh, Earth's magnetic field here. And uh, we get connection. You have... Uh, particles coming to the north and uh, south poles here. Uh, this is a particle view. Uh, you are now the particle coming from the CME, and you're going to impact the magnetic field line here. And so you have charged particles uh, following the Earth's magnetic field lines. And uh, uh, coming here real quick. And uh, they hit the... Uh, 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 the Earth's magnetic field. Now, this is uh, Pat Rafferty. She's uh, uh, astrophysicist or a solar physicist from Rice University. She helped me out with this here. She says the green light comes from collisions with atomic oxygen. Uh, the red light comes from molecular oxygen, O2. Blue is atomic nitrogen, and purple is molecular nitrogen. And when you get these uh, collisions here, you uh, uh, excite the electrons, and they give off photons of different colors. And uh, this translates into a uh, uh, auroras that we see here, and uh, and then, uh, but uh, but yeah, anyways, yeah. So yeah, yeah, Pat Rafferty, yeah, that's it from Rice University. And uh, anyways, so they, uh, so I had some students put this together uh, for me. I showed this in 2009, and then the following year they made it a little bit better, and they put some music into it and and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, so these are some projects that, that students can do here. And I just, I just want to emphasize, uh, it took me about almost five years of working in this GEONS project to get to this level to where I feel comfortable uh, being able to instruct students to do this kind of work here. But uh, it, it, it's a, uh, and, and uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can use it in physics class. Uh, if you want to talk about vectors and finding resultant vectors, you can use it in electricity and magnetism in physics, uh, use it in freshman science classes, earth science, and uh, it can just be applied uh, to uh, uh, whole different disciplines in, in science and stuff. Uh, okay, I think that's probably over five minutes, right? <laughs> okay. uh, hold on, I just wanted to show the scotch tape trick. This is a, uh, a cheap uh, thing you can do here in the classroom. This is more for static electricity. Uh, you can take scotch tape 
and you can kind of uh, go like this, see how they repel right here. Uh, can you see that? Okay, repelling. Then if you take the scotch tape and you put them on top of each other, then you uh, can get them to like each other. Hold on here. They're here. So, so now they like each other. Okay, you can kind of show this. Then the cool thing is if you take running water, a stream of water, which is uh, uh, H2O is a polar molecule, so it's moving electrons, so it kind of has a magnetic field, but you can actually get tape and get the stream of water to move or dance by using this. And this is a good way to show static electricity, charged particles, and water as a polar molecule and the whole thing here just by using scotch tape here. Now, that's a cheap trick you can do, and, and kids are amazed by this. They'll spend... Uh, uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes just playing with this. So if you need to grade papers or do something and you want to keep them occupied, uh, this will work for all levels of students. Uh, I have 18 year olds that do this all for 45 minutes and they'll play with that and stuff. Hey Jim, have, yeah. you ever, have you ever put it on a piece of glass at night? When you tear it off, you'll see a whole series of light oh. shows as it no. releases electrons, no. excites the air. It just, yeah, it'll just make a stream of light as you rip it off of the I've, I've light seen. at night. I'll be, okay, I will definitely try that out. Awesome. <laughs> Things to do with scotch tape. Okay. Thank you so very much, everyone, for sharing, Laura. That was really, that was really amazing. I, you took all of that and was able to put it into, into that time frame and, and do such a thorough explanation and answer questions along the way. And I really appreciated hearing from um, members in our group who have experience using it and how they've used it. That was uh, really well done.